Okay. Thanks so much for joining us. I'll uh, I'll be quick, and then I'll hand it over to our esteemed panelists. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional Indigenous lands that we all live and gather on today. Uh, although this talk is taking place online, we are all located on traditional ancestral Indigenous lands. We are grateful to the Indigenous peoples who have cared for these lands and waters for thousands of years. Um, and I'm also grateful to our uh, three panelists who are with us tonight. Uh, Zach Lepovsky, filmmaker, chair of the National Directors Division, and our moderator, Clara George, uh, chair of the DGC National Sustainability Climate Action Committee, who's been doing uh, an amazing job at spearheading these kinds of initiatives and more. And of course, uh, Warren P. Sonoda, uh, filmmaker and our esteemed very hardworking uh, president at the DGC. Um, we're going to go for an hour to, to an hour and a half today. Um, feel free to uh, chat with each other in the chat and also throw questions in there. Uh, Zach will keep an eye out for questions that way. If, if you want to come in on camera uh, and speak to the gang uh, directly, Zach can also, uh, we can make that happen too. Julian will be in the background uh, running tech throughout. Uh, thank you, Julian, for that. Um, so feel free to engage. Uh, we do have this set up as a meeting and not a webinar so that you can engage directly, ask questions directly of our of our team here and really get involved in, in uh, what is an extremely important conversation and uh, doing it from the perspective of a director um, is a, a, a unique way of looking at this. Uh, so I'm, I'm really pleased with this, and uh, I'm sure this is going to be a really, really fantastic session. I will hand it over to you. Thanks so much, everyone. Awesome. Thanks so much, Hans. And uh, yeah, thank you, Julian, for closing that. So, so great to see everybody. Um, and we're recording this for future generations to know that today was the day we all finally took a stand and saved the planet. So uh, all our names will go down in the history books. Um, very excited to have this conversation. As Hans was saying, really want to encourage you guys to raise your hands at any time, have comments, have questions. Um, the reason we do this is to create a little bit more of a round table feel so that you can all be involved in the conversation. But I'll, uh, I'll steer the conversation a bit with Warren and, and Clara who, who are um, at the forefront of this. Really excited to hear from them. Um, why don't quickly, uh, just to get a little bit more of a sense of sort of, in case people don't know who each of you are, um, maybe uh, start with you, Clara, if give people just a sense of the short version of sort of your bio and what led you to being the person that we've brought here today to, to be the, the, our expert witness. Um, sure. Just getting a sense of who you are. Yeah, thanks. Okay, sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Clara George. I'm originally from Toronto and now I live uh, closer to Vancouver. And I've been, uh, well, my DGC number starts with a two. So, I mean, I think I've been a DGC member since sometime in the early 90s, maybe. Um, I was a production manager for a few years and then started producing. And then I've been a producer for over 25 years, working mainly in television, uh, mainly in network television. And um, kind of through the... I started, I was doing this anyway while I was producing my own shows because I have uh, two daughters who are in their early 20s. And when they were in their teens, they started bringing home news about climate action. And of course, I'd never even thought about it. I read some cool books. I started getting into it. I've always wanted to be a hippie activist. So this is kind of a dream come true. Oh, um, and then uh, in COVID, like I kind of just start, decided that I was going to do this full time. So I have stopped producing and now I am full-time sustainability consultant um, because being a producer, of course, I thought I could produce this better than the people who were doing it. So, um, and but what really happened is I realized that the voice of the filmmakers was not in the conversation. We had a lot of sustainability directors. We had a lot of environmentalists, but we didn't actually have crew who were saying, well, yeah, that's great, but we can't do that or this is how we do that. We also didn't have um, production speed because all of the people involved had full-time jobs. This was their deal. And they didn't understand the reality of 
oh my God, I just got this job. I have four weeks to prep this and four weeks to shoot it. And it's going to air in 12 weeks and it's going to be, my name will be on it forever. So, you know, this, this is basically become like my work to try and bridge this gap between, you know, to get the production community involved in the way that I know the production community can rally. Yeah. Thank you. And we've had some really great conversations um, about the director's role in that, which is really what we're going to be focusing on today, both logistically, but also creatively, uh, which is something that I think often gets uh, really missed in the conversation. I'm so excited to dive into that. But before we do, uh, Warren, why don't you just, for anyone who maybe is outside the DGC or doesn't know uh, you, a quick idea of who you are and, and sort of your, your relation to this topic as well. Sure, Zach. Thank you. And Clara, thanks for taking... Uh this file on as our chair uh, of the National Sustainability Climate Action Committee. Um, I'm Warren Snowda. I'm a uh, Toronto filmmaker uh, and I'm the national president of the DGC. And I'm, I'm, I think I'm friends with many of you on this Zoom. So it's, it's nice to have a friendly room here. Um, specifically on this file, um, Tim Southam, our, our past president, had sort of the prescient vision that um, uh, there were two things that were becoming priorities for, for the guild moving forward. Uh, one being um, inclusion, equity, and uh, diversity, and and climate action and sustainability. And those two, um, I guess, pillars that we've uh, delved into on two different committees have become pretty uh, important, not just uh, for DGC National, but we've seen individual district councils um, come up with their own committees um, to add to the conversation that we're having. So for the for the non guild members that are here, welcome. Um, hope to have you soon. Uh, we're not going anywhere. We'll we'll keep the seat warm for for you to uh, to to jump in when you're ready and and if we can be of service to you. And for the guild members here, we've heard loud and clear that there are are, are significant priorities for you. One being uh, the the climate crisis that we're we're involved in right now, and part of the work that Clara and her committee is doing is to make us aware. And I think Zach, you've hit it right, right in the middle of why we're all here as filmmakers. We didn't even know we had this voice or power to affect change in the work that we did or do, and and part of it is having conversations like this with our with our team and and you know keeping the conversation yeah. going. Well, that is a, a perfect segue to our first uh, topic. Um, and uh, Julian, you can maybe play that first slide, but sort of what the first general thing we're gonna be doing today is just looking at sustainability through the lens of, of a director and all the different ways that both as a leader, both of the crew and setting the priorities of the team, but also as the creative leader of, of, of um, sort of what the priorities are of the narrative and kind of doing everything from that perspective. Um, and so, the, you know, one of the, I think probably the first two questions that come to most directors' minds, and you can close that slide, Julian, um, is like, I'm an episodic director, I can't do anything about this, or I'm a low, I work on low budget stuff, we can't afford to do this. I think those are probably the most common thoughts that, that directors approach. And I thought it'd be good to just talk about those, right? I mean, we're gonna keep coming back to them throughout with practical things all the way along as of the stuff that you can do. But I thought Clara, maybe just hitting those right off the top might be really smart um, so that uh, we can then have a conversation with everyone in the room about them. Sure. Um, I hear that all the time, you know? And I think that there's, well, yes and no. I mean, when you walk in as, a, as an episodic director, Sure, your main cast is there. You don't know the executive producers. You're stuck with a script you might not really like. But, but you know, you direct it. You take ownership of that episode. You take visual ownership. You become the team leader. You work with the crew to have a voice. So as Warren said, you, didn't even, you don't even realize how much power you have. I personally know that I have tried to get two techno cranes on top of Grouse Mountain for a shot. So that would, that didn't come from me. That came from the, you know, so 
so where this, what we really mean by this, and these slides come from the website, if you guys haven't seen it yet, called ggcgreen.ca. Yeah. And where this came from is that, you know, you talk to the departments, you introduce yourself and you come up with whatever, whatever you already have, like, hi, this is me. I only shoot handheld. Hi, this is me. I like really, I like to really work with the actors or I'm really into the visual effects or whatever it is at the words. And I'm really sustainable. And I'm really into that. Um, there's a, I ran, I ran into this on my, when I was producing uh, the magicians and the director show emailed me all the department heads and myself uh, three weeks before his episode and said, hi, this is me. Just so you know, I'm really looking forward to seeing you all again and working with you. Please remember, I don't want any paper unless you unless I request it. I love your art department packages, but I don't need every elevation of every doorknob of every set we're building. I will ask you what I need. You know, I am fine to look at for everything digitally. Please do not get me a big SUV. I would like a small car. You know, so so there's the personal choice. And ask for an electric or a hybrid. Ask for an electric yeah. or a hybrid. There's also the reality of, I, I heard about a location scout where they were shooting up on the coast of um, Vancouver at, at this place, which is gorgeous, called Minotti Bay. And the whole crew was standing there looking and the director was going, yeah, yeah, this is the perfect shot. This is the perfect shot. And one of the crew members said, um, we're on like 200 year old moss here. And they went, oh, okay, let's move. And they got a different angle. So being aware that this is part of you know, this is part of your vision. This is part of your responsibility as you're setting the cameras um, or where you're where you're going with it. And also little things like telling the props people, I don't want to see on screen plastics. You know, like those those things make a huge difference. And that is your that is your power of looking at this and asking the crew, also asking the crew, hey, do you think there's a cool, there's a more sustainable way to do this? Get an electric car as a picture vehicle. You know, like whatever you're doing, you're the director. People will listen to you. They will yeah. they follow this vision. And the other, the other low budget, I can't afford this. <laughs> the other word for sustainability is less. Less fuel, less garbage, less shipping, less vehicles, less new things, less landfill, less water bottles, less whatever you want to call it. The word is less. So actually, you are lim your budget limits you to how uh, ungreen you can be. So you have a better opportunity to be green with a lower budget. It actually it's cost saving, so yeah. you can get more on screen by it. I, I think uh, uh, Zach, and if I could just interject here, uh, less fuel. We we've done. Um, some sustainability um, panels with you, Clara, and really you highlighting fuel consumption was a shock to me about how much of of the the footprint it takes in terms of uh, the environment. And even on a low budget production, uh, you can make you you can make inroads to you know cut that down, right? Oh, absolutely, and I think that. Um... You know, there's a report that I'll, I'll share in the chat, um, the Sustainable Production Alliance, which is all of the major studios in LA um, put together a report and, and it has a regional report on it, which includes filming in Canada. And you can see in the major production centers that fuel is um, like production fuel, like gasoline and diesel is like 60, 70% of the impact of our production. So, you know, part of it is being production friendly. Like we don't have to move across town for this shot. We can figure out how to cheat it here. You just saved a unit move. That unit move is gonna save a lot of fuel. Um, every generator, most generators, most big generators burn about one ton of carbon per day. So, you know, if you're designing stuff and agreeing to 20 generators for a lighting setup, Again, not a low budget problem, but a big budget problem. <laughs> you know, that's big. You know, and so you have the impact to at least ask the questions. Ask yeah, the or for example, the, the yeah. um, another example is in BC, 
there's the, um, a fairly clean grid with and the potential of tying into the grid. And the yeah. city's been um, building sp tie-ins specifically for the film industry. So learning where those are um, can be beneficial too, because then you can also think, oh, I, you know, we can, if we shoot there, we'll be close to a tie-in, which means that um, it can be coming from hydro or things like that. Which, um, would, which in the independent film world will save you money because you don't have to rent right. the generator. You can tap into the grid. It's going to cost you a couple of hundred dollars. Whereas filling that generator, especially in Vancouver, costs about $500 a day to run a generator. In is there a map, Clara, of where the tie-ins are in Vancouver? Yeah, um, yeah, it's on on, yeah, it's on the Real Green um, website, and I'll throw that in the chat as well. But I think also, you know, for some people who might not want to be looking for tie-ins, just tell your, ask your gaffer to do it. Ask your location manager to do it. Like, Again, the sustainability lens of the director is, although you, apologies, micromanage everything, <laughs> you, you don't do all the research, use your crew. You know, if, if you say in the van, like, like even if you're driving around in the scout van and you start talking about tie-ins, I guarantee you that location manager is listening with avid ears. How can I please this director? How can I, what can I help sell? What will help? me sell the location not to mention they're also thinking this is great i'm not going to have a resonant problem i'm not going to have a stinky generator this then you can say oh and by the way i'm going to shoot till two in the morning well it's easier to get your permit if you don't if you're using clean energy so i mean all of this will help get you what you want and save money but again use the power that use the voice that you act that you have and use the same strength that you use with everything else. Yeah, um, really great opening ideas. Um, next topic I wanna to dive into uh, is about the creative, but first I just wanted to see if anyone had any questions or, or ideas they wanted to throw in there. Um, feel free at any time to- I see Grayson writing notes, so yeah. I'm expecting what are you writing, something. What are you writing down, Grayson? Yeah, what are you, what, what, you're, you're, you're... <laughs> you're the smartest one in the room, so yep. tell us what the... <laughs> we'll, hear, we'll hear from you soon. Yeah, I'm, I'm, wait, I'm waiting for it. It's gonna be great. Well, let's let's quickly dive into the next slide, uh, which is one of my one of the, the first that really blew my mind, which is about sustainability that is actually on the screen within the narrative that you're shooting. So what kind of cars are your characters driving? That's totally within your purview as a director. What are they eating? Showing them eating more plant based food or healthier, sustainable foods, um, the type of props, you know, what kind of bag does your character have? Are they holding a, a single use plastic bag or they have a, re a reusable bag? Um, these are all character choices that you could make that um, have an impact on what people see on screen and what normalizes certain behavior on screen. Um, you know, showing people uh, taking bikes or buses or um, doing things that are more sustainable as far as how they transport, transport themselves on screen. Um, the type of actions that they're taking, you know, we often are trying to figure out busyness for them to be doing when they're having to do that two page scene in the kitchen. Well, maybe the busyness they're doing is they're recycling or they're getting the compost ready or they're repairing something instead of buying something new. Um, you know, those are all type of action that you could be having just within the scene um, that is totally within the choice of the director. Um, or some great points here about showing characters that are giving back or volunteering or making those other type of um, sustainable choices rather than showing them throwing away stuff. Although maybe you could see the villain throwing stuff away and demonizing them. Uh, that's what I was thinking today. Um, You're and, projecting uh, your new movie into this, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then through the storytelling lens, you know, um, climate change as just sort of um, a thematic or stakes driven element into the story. Um, floods and fires, uh, you know, being more prominent uh, or people taking actions towards making sure that those things are less prevalent. Um, even in period pictures, um, there's the opportunity for, you know, uh, showing the type of things that people done in the past that have led to this, to, to just sort of bringing those type of topics to the stories that we're telling. Um, that had never occurred to me before really going into this report and has really changed the way that I've done a lot of stuff moving forward. And it's even, it's sort of a good gateway 
uh, drug into the conversation <laughs> with the showrunners and, and producers and stuff. And then it's like, hey, it's important to me that we show this type of world on screen. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I support that. You know, we could even do it with the generators <laughs> kind of kind of wrap them in that way. Um, I know we're putting yeah. um, uh, uh, the the paper bags on screen. Let's talk about <laughs> fuel. I, yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting, Zach. I, I think mainly because I've been doing a lot of um, children's TV and young adult TV a lot. Um, I've... I've I've just seen that our especially our art department teams props they they I haven't seen a plastic bag as a prop in a long time and and I think they've switched over in my head it happened before it became a hot topic they they were just aware that that was it was not a good uh it was not a good look and um I I think a lot of the stuff we do in kids TV feeds into exactly that sort of theme of protecting the environment and like oh there was always a mandate of like if there's food it's healthy food and you know um i have done scenes where uh people are you know um what do you what do you call it collating the, the recyclables and making sure that they go in the right uh right slot so um you know if if you work in the world of kids television which many of us do when we first get into episodic tv directing um, you know, lean into that. I, I think I think that the producers would be very. They're, they're probably already doing it, but um, you know, anything you can add to their toolkit would be great. Yeah, Claire, anything you wanted to add to that topic? Well, I think it's just like you said that you know we're we're shaping minds, right? I mean, that's what that's what programming debt like. That's what we're doing. We're we're trying to change culture, and I think that people, a lot of people, are kind of scared to have the conversation. I think there was this great report that came out of Albert in the UK, which is their sustainability um, organization. It's called Albert. I have no idea why. They regret it, but they're stuck with the name now. Okay. Um, but there's a whole article about that or the, or the Good Planet Playbook or Climate Content Pledge. I mean, this is the story of our time. This is one of the stories that everybody is talking about. And yet I think it's mentioned one percent compared to the word cat you know like okay. like it's just well, we're never going to beat cats but let's just no <laughs> but i mean talking about it but if you but like when i walk around and listen to people talking they're talking about the weather they're talking about yeah. the floods they're talking about what's happening in california they're talking the, about the forest the fire. fires yeah you know like to be not part of that conversation is really not being authentic to what you're doing right now um i also think that the the big um, all the climate, major climate activists have this new way of trying to talk about it, calling climate optimism, because they've realized that if you're just talking about doom and gloom all the time, then you become immobilized with fear and somebody's, and everybody thinks somebody else will do it. So showing anybody being proactive is such a huge, um, it's a, it's so huge to the, the impact that you're making, and we can't we can't measure the impact that this kind of storytelling makes yet. They're trying to figure out a way how to measure that. But for example, uh, Universal Features just announced that part of their green lighting process is going to include a climate action plan for production and for on screen sustainability. Um, Telefilm, you have to you have to disclose your your plan. And I know that for festival consideration, you have to point out your climate action storytelling and, you know, BBC funding. And I think Austria just uh, made their tax credits related to sustainability. So this yeah. is like happening and we need to kind of prepare ourselves to have these answers. So because everybody is kind of nobody's saying, oh, yeah, you know, you know what, let's just trash the planet we don't we don't want to do anything like nobody's don't, saying don't put that in your sustainability plan um <laughs> don't put that on your sustainability plan do you have any um i i just did two telephone applications and built the sustainability plan for those films what would you say would be good tips to have in a sustainability plan like specifically for telephone when you're applying to them like what do you think they're looking for in that plan there i think they're i have well i'm 
totally caught off guard because I haven't seen that application. But I think that what everyone's looking for. All it says is please provide a sustainability plan. Oh, okay. <laughs> it gives, it gives so, no, it gives no know, sort of indication of what, how long it should be or what should be in it. Or so, I mean, it would even start with just, I, I intend to make sustainability part of the production. I want to, you know, I'm going to engage the department heads to discuss how to be more sustainable. Um, and on the DGC Green website, it has, it'll go through every single one. So for example, if you were a studio driven set, a studio driven show where you're building most of your stuff, you would be using sustainable materials to build and building in a modular fashion so that you're using less materials. If you're a road show, you would either have a smaller unit or look for grid tie-ins or try and minimize your location moves. You know, those things, those two things would, would save a lot. But I think also what they wanna see is, um, they well, they wanna see on-screen sustainability. I know that there's a, an episodic show, I can't remember what it's called, shooting in Newfoundland right now, that's a co-production with Germany. And we were we met with the art director. Yeah, as, that's an that's an Rex. Right, as yeah. part of the uh, sustainability uh, meetings, because they were said it, we met through the art department caucus, and the art director said that they are not allowed to show on screen plastics because it's in the distribution co production agreement with Germany. So, like, what Telefilm's looking for is to ma make sure that your show is marketable outside of Canada. <laughs> You know, so, yeah. and yeah, and like you said, in Ireland, there's a sustainability manager. So like we, you know, any of those things that show that you're proactive. And I think that Telefilm is working on developing criteria of what that means. It's not just going to be an open paragraph for a while. It's going to become a checklist. Yeah. And I know that I help. I was working uh, with Telefilm to look at their budget template and just help make that more sustainable just in the names of the, yeah. uh, you know, instead of garbage, waste management, instead I, of generators, mobile power, which includes batteries and tie-ins and hybrids and soon hydrogen will be here in the next year. Um, I th you know, I'm sure we'll get into discussions about carbon calculators and, and answering a little bit more in detail, Zach, about what goes into a good sustainability plan for production. But I just, I want to just go back to what you said about climate optimism, because I do like that I like that approach in a way that opens doors for people, um, especially either filmmakers, our, our team, our heads of department, our crew, so that it's not so heavy handed when we when we bring this up, because I think, um, listen, if we don't if we don't do anything, nothing will happen. But if we do these small little things in the course of this this generation peer group of filmmakers who knows what the next generation will be doing and i kind of look at um what gina davis did um for uh gender awareness gender parity um when when they you know when her foundation started gathering data it will probably look like something like that right clara where studios would be able to through their advanced AI technology look at the 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 trove of content that's coming through their system and go this meets the sustainability criteria of what we see on screen and then the audit whatever the the you know to meet to meet the the telefilm like Zach's movie is sustainable it has to pass some sort of criteria I'm assuming and it will just get more defined as things go on um, but you know, I, I love the idea of being optimistic about it because because if we're defeatist, then then there's that whole chorus of people going, well, why even bother, right? And that's what we're trying to 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 guard ourselves against, or or to or to rebuff with a more optimistic outlook. Yeah, and you can say that in the in the the sustainability plan. I I, I put a bunch of stuff in there about the the themes in the film and how those apply to sustainability or or sort of optimism or those types of things or you know what the character arcs are and how that so it's not just we're going to be you know not serving a lot of beef at lunch mm -hmm. it's it's like how is the film going to help that narrative become normalized and um and increase the amount of people that are excited about making change 
within the story without the story having to be about sustainability. It can just be the the essence of some of the ideas that are going in there. Well, one uh, of the all right. Examples, yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Alan. Uh, hi. Um, hey, Alan. You said, about, uh, you said something about serving lunch. Now, now that we're kind of like getting out of COVID, uh, yeah. I've been going to meetings and whenever there is like food served, it's always on paper plates and plastic forks. And even though they, everyone talks about the environment, they're still serving food and paper plates in these meetings. Yeah. So, I, not, you know, this is small compared to the, uh, uh, the fuel, but it all adds up. So what do you tell some people like, yeah, you know, if you really believe in sus sustainability, uh, you know, just simple things like how do you serve the food? So you're not wasting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Clara, do you have a thought on that? Yeah. I mean, again, I think that, I think Thank that you, people are doing business as usual, you know, and COVID changed what business as usual is. And now we're stuck in the COVID business as usual. And I think the more that we remind people you know, that we want it done differently. And, and again, depending on whether you're a visiting director or if it's your show is how much power you have to talk to the production office. But, you know, there's a company in Toronto that I know a couple of the productions I'm working with are using that are zero waste packaging. Um, I know that the shows I'm working with are donating food, leftover food to, um, to, you know, to shelters that are close to the production offices. And I think it's, it's starting the conversation. And I think with, you know, to just c continue for a second on that word optimism, and then looking back at the sustainability lens, what the director can give the crew is safety. They can say, I'm going to, I'm okay with you doing it differently. I'm okay if I have to order from a restaurant that you knows you know, uses compostables, or I'm okay putting my dish in the dishwasher, you know, but also the, like a lot of these things, the crew wants to please, but they're tired, they're exhausted, they're stressed out, and they have a huge agenda. So if they think for a second that they're going to get a side look or talk down or just like whatever, or a comment about, oh yeah, that lunch sucked they're going to not do it right so you got so again the the director has the power to make this a safe space for the discussion yeah one one story In, that go ahead one story that comes to mind that i think is a great example of exactly what claire is talking about and food <laughs> to your question alan is i was on a show years ago and series and the dp uh on day 1 uh came back uh, you know we were we were serving food completely disposably and you know in all the containers and plastic forks and the whole thing and the dp showed up with a um metal container and metal cutlery sort of like a almost like metal tupperware mm. um and asked for his food to be you know served in that so that he could then take it home and wash it and then um and then by the end of the week the whole camera department had sort of taken the lead from the dp because well if the boss is doing it they got to do it. Um, and seeing the whole camera department for the run of the show, eating out of metal containers when the rest of us weren't, had a pretty big impact on sort of everyone just question without, they weren't asking everyone to do it. They weren't shaming anybody, but they were just leading by example, one person led by example, and then it flowed through his department. Um, and then the next show I did with that production company, um, a year later, we had, um, you know, because obviously it made an imp impression on the producers as well. We had a caterer that was able to do plates and cutlery and wash it at the end of the day. And the production was willing to pay them the extra hour it took to wash, you know, all That's the cutlery. So, and, and so then the entire production was now on that. And the crew didn't necessarily have to make any different choice in that matter. They were just getting plates and then they just, you put your cutlery in one bin and your plate in the other. And then the the uh the catering team washes them but it was a very like um very clear sequence of events from one guy showing up with one metal container basically um and so when you go to a lunch or you go to a meeting you don't necessarily have to convince them 
but you can show up with your water bottle or your, you know, your, your reusable water bottle or your reusable Tupperware and it'll spur a conversation and it'll lead by example. And that'll just have, um, echoes that, um, you don't even have to control. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so I just thought that's always just such a great example of, of the type of change that a department head can have. Um, Samina. Hey guys, thank you so much. I'm, I'm like taking so many notes. There's lots of, lots of good ideas coming through the pipe, but, uh, I'm just, I'm curious because, um, I'm in a unique position with production that we're in sort of a, a tenant, uh, tenant landlord situation almost. And what I'm having trouble with is we have production coming in under the premise that they have a sustainability manager whole season goes by this person never gets hired i uh my work paid for me to take a course i've gone through real greens training um i'm trying to make those initial steps to inspire people however i'm not in i'm not like a department head right like i'm not even actually involved in the production um and i feel like the only way i'm able to appeal is to make this cost effective for production and I really do think there's a lot of economics steeped in uh, people's laziness and indifference. Um, the economics of it, as Clara mentioned, exhausted film crews, um, inexperienced film crews, especially in Alberta. We don't have the same level of awareness as in, in general as Vancouver does in terms of it, it took me moving to Vancouver and living in Vancouver to actually develop a social consciousness that's actually just steeped in the culture out there. And I'm just wondering from your perspective, you know, as something as simple as the containers, as Zach, you're describing, um, we had a company called Earthware that showed up and uh, they actually get, uh, sorry, I just lost my thought there. Um, Earthware? Earthware, a company <laughs> came Sorry, to set. I, just, I feel like I'm going on a tangent. I'm going on a no, tangent. No, it's good. It's good. We're, we're uh, with you. Yeah, but Earthware is essentially, I can't make it cost effective. I can't make these containers as cost effective as a compostable container that goes, and sometimes a compost isn't even going into compost. It's just going straight into a landfill. So it's like, how do I, how do I, how do I sell them on it? I think that's what I'm asking you guys. How do I sell them on it? Yeah. Clara, are there are there sort of like economic gotchas that are really great to arm everybody with? <laughs> yeah, I think so. And I think also just to remember that the goal is to be as sustainable as possible. It's not going to work every time. But just by starting that conversation and keeping that conversation going, you will make an impact. However, the big the big economics is that everybody is only, you know, as a producer, I always used to laugh when someone said, oh, can I bill that back to special effects? Well, it's all in one budget, guys. It's all in one budget. So, but that's not how it's divided out. And we have this amazing lump sum of money, which is usually one to 2% of the entire production budget called the fuel account. So anyone who says to me, they don't have money for sustainability, I go, well, how much do you want to save? And I go, like, what's your goal? Like 5%, 10%? What's your, you know, how much do you want to lower your carbon impact? They go, wow, well, you know, 10% would be great. And I go, great, take 10% of your fuel budget and spend it on spend it on stuff that doesn't use fuel. You know, move the money around. And what we never look at is the operational cost, right? So like when I went to the caters, because I had to, I converted our show to reusables. And the network wasn't just going to let me add, you know, I bought a dishwasher secondhand for $8,000. I brought in a PA to do the, like it was a restaurant thing. So it took like five seconds per load. We had three sets of, you know, hospital melamine kind of thing. I mean, we had to spend $25,000 in prep to set the show up. Right. So I went to the caters and I say, how much do you spend on disposables? Well, I had no idea they bought 800 forks a week you know they were spending thousand they were spending a thousand dollars a week on disposables we had a 13 week run there's thirteen thousand dollars i can put towards you know put towards reusable dishes 
So I had the same question about somebody who said that, well, the production doesn't want to use, and, and believe me, I swore we would not talk about water bottles, but here we go. So <laughs> here, we, here we go. So production doesn't want to put refill stations, right? Okay, well, a refill is three liters, right? That's three flats of water bottles. Calculate, ask craft service how many flats of water bottles they buy and figure out if it's worth the $7 for the refill station. Like it's $7. There's no way that three flats of water bottles are going to cost, you know, maybe they cost, even if they cost $6 for $1. And then I said, estimate how many, how many bags of garbage is it? So three flats of water bottles is going to be three bags of garbage. Well, garbage costs money to tip. So, so look at all the costs associated to build your business case. It's not just the generator rental. It's the fuel that goes into the generator. It's the parking spot that the generator has to go in. It's the locations people who have to show up to park the generator. It's the security guy who has to stand there to make sure that everything's okay, right? All of those costs go into the cost versus a tie-in, right? Like we're not comparing apples to apples. And if you're really looking at this as, a, as if you're trying to do the financial case, and again, I'm going back to the way I usually work with directors. So they're going to say, show me. So you go to the caterer and you say, show me. You let the caterer build the business case. Let the set decorator build the business case. You know, one of the, the simplest things you can, you can do is you can make, you know, we rented a, a regular car, like a car hatchback and gave it to the set deck department. So they didn't drive the five ton truck to drop off checks to the to the rental houses. We saved the cost of that car twice in fuel. So it's like you you, you know, we can we're so good at building the arguments when we want something. So build it the other way. <laughs> you know, it's like that's what how many times did you know? We know how to build these art. We know how to build these arguments and get what we want and use that same strategy, but enlist the departments who are doing it or who you're asking them to do. And if this production won't deal with, you know, the dishes, which I know is really annoying, then say, okay, can we at least donate food? Because honestly, the donating of the food or reducing your meat by two thirds or, you know, having a, I don't do meatless Mondays because it pisses everyone off. I just reduce the beef totally. But like <laughs> those those things are actually more impactful than the compost. And your crew will feel better because they're not eating so much beef. My crew <laughs> didn't get sick. It was yeah. the first time they didn't get sick because we had cut out sugar and uh, we reduced beef by two thirds. And then it was hilarious. This this amazing, like the the prep driver, TMI, but he came in and he went, I've lost 30 pounds. My wife, because I'm uh, ill. <laughs> I'm like, oh. Before Zach throws to Grayson, I just want to riff off of what you just said there, um, Clara, in terms of the overall picture. Um, when you go back to your initial uh, note of feel is 60 to 70% of the, of the budget, that uh, budget spend that you have to, to, to put to a unit, that's that's why you don't want to talk about water bottle um, recyclables, right? Because it's it, that those that's a small piece of a overall puzzle that's tied to fuel com consumption for a unit. So that that's really the place for the PMs that are here and the production people that are here. That's that's really the big ticket item. Yeah, is that kind of a good way to analyze your your yeah, I mean, ind indignation I think... to water bottle? Uh, yeah, well, well, my well. Also, I feel like we know how to do that. We do it at home, right? We just suddenly get on set and we, you know, it's like that film immunity where you walk through someone's living room with mud on your boots. You know, it's like we don't we don't do that at home. Don't do that on set. If you don't want plastic water bottles, don't buy them. You know, just don't buy them. The crew will figure it out. They'll bring a they'll bring a usable bottle, but have the water refill stations. It's like the biggest joke in the world that people spend more per liter per water when we have clean tap water like we have clean tap water in this country we're lucky you know it's free well in, in some places Clara. In some places <laughs> or, yes. you're right yeah. Absolutely. We, we have a long way to go in some other places 
You're absolutely right. Yeah. Totally. Um, if you're shooting in Vancouver, you know, that's in a production facility. Usually you can do that or you can, you know, but the, yes, it's, it's a very small impact. Waste and waste is a very small impact on a production. Um, however, it is the one, it is 99% of what crew care about. So it, in order to get them to start thinking about tie-ins and turning off their engines and not idling and, and all the other things that are huge for the, for the scope one and two emissions, um, we do have to address the garbage. I just feel like we know how, we know what those solutions are. And honestly, if, if, I, I kind of almost want to like I I know crew now who have worked on shows where there are no sustainability efforts in place and if they get an offer they jump. You know they don't want to work under those working conditions, so I think that's that's another part of this is that it's it's upsetting to watch productions or be on productions that aren't doing anything. Yeah, well said. Um, we have a few other topics to get to, but first I want to get to Grayson and your question go ahead um it's not a question but more of a statement um i have a really hard time with like the construction we use and the waste that we have from the construction and there's two parts to this one um i've been watching a lot of documentaries uh, on africa right now where because they're used as a landfill a lot of the times for western worlds and these kids are figuring out ways to create energy or something out of the garbage that we throw with clothing would and i'm wondering if that's maybe a contest that we can do where like kids can figure out how to use the stuff that we're throwing out to better the environment whether it be they figure out um you know the the materials that we're throwing out the cloth like the the cloth the all the stuff where they can figure out a way to use it that benefits society i mean like you're seeing water bottles being made out of plastic bags, like all this stuff. I just am wondering if that's a possibility, which A, makes the industry look a lot better throwing stuff like this and it keep it gets people involved in, like it's a it's a tactic in making it more fun to, to do that. The other thing is, is like when we destroy sets and stuff, I'm wondering if there's a way that we don't destroy them to the point we couldn't just to donate the material to schools. Yeah something where they can reuse the flats because it's really infuriating seeing all these bins of, of stuff and then the, the other part is is when we're talking about cars and stuff I'm just wondering if we can like normalize either because there is a production a friend of mine and in Europe they do this all the time there's a spot that people drive to and then a van from the production company picks the crew up and takes them like it's a central spot instead of everybody driving out to Langley or normalize the fact that people carpool the amount of people higher up that look down on people who a don't want to drive home at two o'clock in the morning or have trouble seeing on the roads and they want to carpool and they look down on those people for not having their own individual cars is really infuriating to me. I would think that you would get praised for carpooling because now you've got two, three, four people in a car. You've got one car instead of four cars. And a lot of the times when people get to set, they're just on set. Like they're not driving anywhere else. So yeah, I think those are the three, like the, those are the three thoughts that I've had a lot over the last like two years. My but I do have like a huge frustration with like a nor not being able to normalize carpooling and then where all of our sets go, especially when they're like movies, like, you know, um, you know, Disney movies that come in, all those sets are torn down and thrown out. Um, okay. I'm going to, I will pass it to Marion about the circular economy of set building in one second, Marion, I'm just going to answer the other ones. Um, the carpooling, absolutely, I did that on all my productions. That is a safety thing. Um, people should be allowed to drive. COVID stopped it. Hopefully, we'll get it back. I think it's one of those things where, um, you know, I know you're in location. So as you're doing that and saying, and here's where we can do a carpool shuttle. And usually, we only do it if you're out of the boundary, but we should do it, period. Um, I completely agree with you. Um, I had my crews carpool together to like the art department came with one vehicle to come look at it, scout at a location instead of five, again, pre-COVID. Um, the other thing about waste to energy, we do that. We do that in Vancouver. 
Um, composting is used for natural gas, renewable natural gas. Um, we also have, there's a construction bulldoze company um, um, that Copy actually, that. Got that. Jose, you're on. You yeah, know. you got to get the unit over there, Jose. Um, so there is a company. Go, go uh, to. It's on, <laughs> on the real green list where a construction coordinator had exactly the same frustration. So if you had to bulldoze a set, it is put into pellets and it is actually given to create energy. I believe it, it's at, it's at, it used to be at BCIT, it's another factory. So we are doing that, but Marion will talk to you about circularity. Um, hi, I won't uh, take much time because uh, I think it's really great that it's focused on what directors can do, but just uh, uh, Grace, into your point that things are being done and uh, part of it does um, lie in the, in the hands of like design, designers to sort of plan what the out, out, what the, what the route out is before they even design something. So you don't design something without understanding what you're going to do with it at the end. So this is conversation. These are conversations that are definitely happening more and more. And hopefully, you know, with all these other strategies, this will become normalized as well. So it hasn't, it isn't like off the radar. It's definitely on radar, not with everybody, but there are strategies being done to create, you know, whether it's, um, scenic elements that are like standardized in size so they could be reused over and over again and certainly many construction managers are very also engaged in, in in less waste and I just had a conversation with a group of people the other day and it's a company that um, is actually was based in Vancouver and and also has a branch in um, Finland I think called can do which is fantastic because what they're planning to do is take all the scraps of wood maybe you're not in your head maybe you've heard of them they're they're planning to take the scraps of wood and they've actually already working with ubc and sfu about um, machines that basically compress all the material and turn it into new dimensional lumber so anyway there are strategies happening it's not as easy as like you know getting a, a, a three gallon water container instead of a single use water bottles but hopefully in, in a year or so, there'll be, and, and part of it mindset and design mindset as well as other strategies. So again, and, it's all And great. part of it, just to pull this back to directors, part of it is you talking to your production designer and saying, I'm okay if we use the flats from the dorm in the hallway, just repaint them. Yeah, I don't yeah. need, you know, have the conversation at the beginning and say, and with your DP and establish that you need 10 foot walls. Mm -hmm. always so you're not cutting 12 foot flats down to eight and then the next set is a 10 and now you have to buy new flats yeah. right so this is i had a problem with a, a studio studio that didn't have enough power so they were going to run a jet a 1500 amp generator for air conditioning so i had a meeting with the dp and the designer and said i know we're building the house set what can we do to keep this cool enough that at least we only have to bring in the air conditioner for the warm scenes. By the way, it was a horror film. So there were only three daylight scenes in the entire movie. So they were able to use all, you know, design so the windows open, design so there's airflow, use LED lighting for the night scenes, for the night work. And we ended up not requiring a generator. So there's another fuel thing, but it goes back to the conversation the director can have at the beginning saying, this is important to me. How do we, the you know, you don't have to figure this out. The production designer has to figure it out. And, and give that collaborative conversation for sure. You know, just how can we all do this efficiently and effectively and, and beautifully and sustainably. Yeah. yeah. And um, I just wanted to highlight the link that Clara put into the chat of the sustainability lockup, which is in, in Vancouver, which is also a good resource for shows that are very low budget. Like the idea there is they take the stage flats and all that type of stuff that you take everything basically they take everything that a show doesn't need and instead of taking it to the dump you take it to the lockup and then other shows can come and just take it for their show um and when i've done lower budget stuff we definitely go and check to see what they've got uh you so that we don't just have... just to clarify you pay a fee with your truck yeah. it's five thousand five hundred bucks i think for five ten or something like that to drop it off there but then yes anyone that comes to get it it's free well, yeah. but once you, but also once your production pays that five hundred dollars, which is the same as the landfill load dip, tipping fee, because garbage isn't free, which goes back to the business case. Um, once you've paid that one dump, you can pull 
20 trucks load full of free stuff. You never pay again. You just have to pay the one, you just have to pay when per, you dump Per production, it per production. Pull. Yes. So you yep. pay it when you dump it and then you, you pull for free. Awesome. I think Supernatural on season 20 had to pay a reuse though. <laughs> um warren did you have a comment yeah just a quick uh thing marion thanks for that i appreciate that and i i love the idea of how integral production design production designers are um in the mix of this conversation we have as our guest i hate to put you on the spot david hackle uh not only an amazing director but also a phenomenal production designer you don't have to speak yet david but are, are there any tips or tricks from someone that has done both things to approach it. And also Roger Boyer, I see you're, you're here. I am halfway done your script. Let's talk on the weekend. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to hear David, if you had any tips for directors to speak the language that Miriam would reciprocate to. Hey, yeah, I look, I concur with everything that Marion said. Um, something I can say is that I have always as a production designer and as a director, looked at recycled sets, recycled props. Um, you know, I, I can't think of a production I've ever been on where just based on economics, we didn't have to go after, you know, another set and, and say, hey, can we use your set when you're done? Um, on uh, Salt and Peppa, we used all the sets from suits for, for the apartments um, for Salt and Peppa. Um, and, uh, and I can say definitely on Saw 2, and on all the Saw movies, we constantly recycled other sets and brought them in simply because we couldn't afford anything else. Um, but also, you know, it just it just feels better. You know, these things have they have a life to them already, and they turn into something more beautiful. Uh, the, the entire house of Saw Two was something we pilfered from the studio right next door. They shut down a month before we started, and I went to them and said, "Can we have your set? We'll take it away. We'll literally walk it through the studio wall." <clears throat> through the loading door into our studio and we we designed the set by standing up the flats kind of going well that works here we can put that here we can put that there staircase door you know here's what we have and we designed that way um and and i've always done that um and i think that i'm, I'm sure marion has i'm sure every production designer worth their weight in gold um has done it but it it just makes sense because as marion said you have to incorporate into your budget right from the beginning, the fact that you, you have bins you're gonna fill at seven, $750 to $1,200 a bin just to get stuff out of the studio at the end, that makes a big difference. If, it, if that's chopping away at your front end and, and of your ability to actually get something in front of the camera, well, you're gonna make decisions, right? You can make good decisions. So it actually works to, to our benefit to, to constantly try to recycle things. And, and of course, you know, I love antiques and, and, you know, props or props that are, that have already had a life, you know, they, they look much better. They're, you know, they're already broken down in many cases. And I know wardrobe people have always done this as well. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it exists is what I'm saying in the industry by necessity, but I think if we're more conscious about it, uh, you know, it can be, it can also be a lot of fun and ins inspiring too. So, you know, um, and, you know, definitely as a director, and a director production designer, I, I never let up on it, of course. I pick locations based on, on beautiful textures. I love locations more than building because of locations, textures. So that, that makes a big difference. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, we have a few more topics to get to, but we'll quickly go to Samina. Uh, you're muted there. We can't hear you yet. First media award. I just have a couple quick questions regarding uh, non-disclosure agreements with uh, things like props, especially in like television episodic production, um, people not wanting to dispose of or recycle uh, certain props because of NDAs. And then I'm just curious what you guys are doing in Vancouver regarding uh, recycling foam specifically for set making and recycling uh, paint. The NDA part is tough. Um, but if you start early enough with the studio, they all have different policies. So you can, you know, the problem where my, what I've run into is 
we have to get rid of it really quickly. This has to go through legal. We don't have enough time. Let's pitch it. So if you know, again, as Marion said, if you have an out plan at the beginning and you, you know, in prep, you line up where things can be donated, what language do you need in the contracts in order for them to be reused, repurposed. And, you know, if it's really that important, send it to the studio and archive it. They'll keep it. You know, they'll put it in some display years from now, um, you know, or I, so, but I think that that, that stuff is the more lead time you have. Again, we make better decisions in prep than we make during the shoot sometimes. And definitely at the end when we're scrambling to get out. So I think yeah. when we're not exhausted, we may like set it up. Um, in terms of foam, I know that uh, there, what show was it? Land Before Land Before Time. It can't be that Land Before Time. It's the other one. Anyway, it was a, it was, it was a remake of a sci-fi thing. Land of the Lost, right? The construction crew had some time to wrap. So they they shaved off the paint from the foam. So it was white foam and recycled it all of their entire set. So, and then in terms of paint recycling, you shouldn't be using the hazmat stuff. All that it's also check out what's available in your area and follow those rules. So if you can't recycle oil-based paints in Alberta, then don't buy oil-based paints by the water-based paints. You know, a lot, this is, it's kind of supply and demand. So there's no point having the best idea in the world if A, production won't use it, and B, we don't know how to get rid of it. So if you know, and, and that's also kind of to Grayson's point as well, is that, you know, some of those bins that you're looking at that you're so frustrated with are actually going to the right place, but the crew doesn't know it. So the, I would ask, you know, I always ask whenever I'm working with sustainability advisors on sets or sustainability people, I'm like, find out what the waste management system is at the studio you're working at. And then put um, a poster up, let people know. Cause the crew is making assumptions and it becomes, it becomes what, uh, you know, myth, cultural myths or whatever they're called, where it's like, oh, we don't recycle. Well, yeah, we do. You know, like let's bust those myth, those bad myths, so that people have more faith in the system, and then people know what to do. Okay, that's. Thank awesome. you. I I appreciate that answer. Yeah. Um. Before we go to you, Jose, I'm just going to go to the next few slides, and then we'll come back to you. Um. The I think we can skip the production choices one because we've basically been already talking about that for a while. So, um, just quickly, the two next slides we'll we'll touch on, which are sort of personal choices that the director can make. Um, one is going paperless, which we can talk about in more detail. There's a bunch of different resources I can put people towards, but in some ways that's what Claire was talking about of like, personally, you can just, and I've done this on every show I'm on, is just tell the office, I don't use paper, don't print anything, that I will not use it if you print it, <laughs> I will lose it. Don't, uh, I was once on a show and one of the PAs came running over and they're like, oh, the office has, has delivered something personally, a driver just arrived. Where do you want me to put this? I'm like, I guess in my trailer. I don't know. I don't even know where my trailer is. And they ran off. And at the end of the day, the ADs came running out and like, this came from the office for you. It's from it was delivered by a driver. And I opened it and it was in like a, a goldenrod crew list or something that they had like rushed to the set on a night shoot to like give to me for some reason. Um, but so just like making it clear that you're paperless and uh, and having your own tools to do so, which I can go through. Um, Clara has some great points about your trailer in that um, often there's, it's not just the trailer and moving around the trailer around, it's heating the trailer. There's a lot of um, stuff that goes into heating your trailer that you may not even be aware of because often as directors, we never even go to our trailer <laughs> because, we're, because we're on set so so often. This, but, this is more an episodic thing than an independent yeah, film thing, Zach. That is true. <laughs> but it is, a, it is still, there might be a generator running the whole day to keep your trailer warm even though you never go to it. So letting the transportation department, and then Julian, if you just go to the next slide as well, um, um, around personal choices uh, uh, on your own transportation, uh, not only just the transportation for the, the whole crew can obviously have, um, you know, can have vehicles being more sustainable, but even as a director, you can, uh, you can make asks, like for example, 
You could um, minimize the amount of times that you travel. You can ask for more sustainable travel methods that you're uh, traveled in. Um, you can, for example, fly an economy and ask them to put the rest towards carbon offsets instead of flying you in business class. Um, you can uh, encourage an anti-idling policy, those types of things. That'll, um, thanks, Julie, you can close that. I'll throw it to Clara just quickly on these, on these topics. Is there anything that I kind of missed um, talking about sort of the personal choices that a director can make? Yeah, the most impactful thing I've seen is that for some reason, we were picking up the director in a Sprinter van. Um, no idea why. <laughs> so I said, you know, let's just get a car. And we got, we ended up getting a, a at the time it was a plug-in. It wasn't even electric yet. And because it was a, a hybrid car that would idle without fumes, they got Rockstar parking at the Sutton place. So now the, you know, our episodic director was, you know, not getting wet while the huge feature directors had to walk across to the sprinter vans. So, you know, there's so many times when you can say, I don't need it. I don't need to look like, you know, a rock star here in an S black SUV with tinted windows, like just give me a car, you know, um, that's huge. The, the trailer thing, again, it's just how you communicate, you know, they're gonna, if, if you say to the driver, Hey, you know what? I really like it at 18 degrees. It'll be at 18 degrees, you know, and, and because it's at normal room temperature, it's not going to create the spikes in the generator, which are going to force them into a larger generator. So, and, and also if you're not actually using it, you can just say, you know what, you don't need to bring mine to location this tomorrow. I'm not going to use it because you know, there's limited parking. You were on the tech scout, you know, everyone's scrambling about where to park. You know, you're shooting by this on the side of a mountain. Maybe you need your trailer or, and maybe, maybe that's okay. Like, that's fine. That's where you work. But if it's just letting, communicating what you're actually using. If you're not using paper and you don't tell anyone, you're not really doing anything. If you don't need five sets of sides in different sizes delivered to you on set when you come in the morning, then, then tell them. So what we did is we had a print on demand um, kind of policy uh, on the show. We reduced, it was a 13 episode run, eight days, seven or eight days per episode. I can't remember. Um, One million sheets of paper was what was used in season three. By season five, we knocked it down to 325,000 sheets. And I think 250 of that was in accounting. And not only that, it was kind of iPad wars. Who had the coolest iPad cover? Who had the best Ooh. pencil? Ooh, you got the new pencil. It's like, we spent all day talking about footwear on shows. Who has the best boots? Whose feet are dry? You know, just change the conversation. Yeah, quickly, um, before I go to Jose, just share a few tools um, that if people aren't, um, yeah, Naveen's already ahead of me. Um, the first one that a lot of people use, I'll just uh, quickly share my screen here, is Scriptation which is an incredible sort of iPad um, script annotating app. Um, the reason it's sort of killer feature, which you can use for free, is that all of the annotations you, you put on the script um, transfer over to the new draft of the script. So when you get new pages and all the, there's omitted scenes and there's, you know, stuff, the PDF has, has, has changed because of the new draft, it'll take all of your annotations and move them over to that new draft intelligently so that you don't have to redo your notes. Um, so that this is sort of like the, the killer app for, um, for people, which you can get at scriptation.com. Uh, Shot Designer is one that a lot of directors use for doing overheads, uh, also on your iPad. A little old in the tooth now, but it's still a pretty powerful app for doing um, uh, overhead designs and having those all digitally and being able to share them digitally. Um, plug myself, I have an app called Shotluster, which is the ooh, best ooh, shot listing ooh, app. Ooh in the world um and we're about to read a whole new version uh, this summer but it allows you to do digital shot listing and share that all with the crew live as your schedule changes throughout the day um, this is your one... chair of the national directors division folks <laughs> zach lepofsky yeah. who yep. just had to design his own app because he just didn't okay. have the, the the he didn't find the one he liked that's amazing uh yeah well it didn't exist um if you're not familiar with slack slack is an amazing tool for communication with the whole um crew 
and is used widely amongst almost all you know sectors uh, now. Um, one of the really great things of Slack is using Slack for distribution because one of the great things about Slack is it makes it very easy to find documents and find stuff that's been shared with everybody. So you can create a channel for distro and all the different, or you can, there can be a channel for the art department where all of their stuff that's been published is all there, very easy to, to go through, um, almost easier than having a Dropbox link or something like that, that everyone's trying to go back or going through your emails. So I've found that Slack is an incredibly good tool for sharing documents with the whole team digitally. And then uh, Evernote, there's a lot of apps like Evernote, but I've found that Evernote is like the best one for just almost your own little internet of documents and notes and things like that, that you're, anytime you get sent anything that you don't want to lose, um, Evernote is sort of an incredible tool for that because it'll, it search, it's basically like a search engine for yourself that you can build. So instead of having to remember where you put all your documents or all the things that people have emailed to you and nesting them all within folders and trying to remember that hierarchy, don't do that at all. Treat your files like like the internet where you, you put all of your files into Evernote and then you search for them. And it can even search the text within the documents and bring them up for you and, and then uh, allow you to kind of share them. So those are some great tools that you can use to go paperless and feel free to reach out to me if you want more tips. And now we'll go to Jose because he's been waiting a long time if you're still there. I'm still here. Thank you very much, Zach. Yeah, um, your, my uh, comment, my proposal. Yeah, my comment, proposal, suggestion, and I've been uh, proposing this for a long time and I will continue to propose it until it sticks, especially with directors and art directors. I don't know what the situation with from recycling is Marco Bedinsky, who is special effects on the astronauts from Nickelodeon, had a company that recycled star uh, polystyrene. He up having that business which is profitable for the alternative these days, and it's commercially available and it has been commercially available for a long time now, is mycelium foam. And it comes in shapes that you anybody can shape any how they want those natural paints that come from cow dung that can very well be silver even if they have to be ported for their so you uh, people uh, and I will look into them and into mycelium foam and can for it. Because styrene is it continues to break down, continue to go through rivers and waterways, yeah. and recycling <laughs> is very difficult. Thank you, Jose. We're, yeah, thank you for that. Jose, your audio, yeah, yeah, your audio good. was really bad, but because I've heard this before, it's like basically there's new foam out there that is completely biodegradable, made from mycelium. So, you know. What I guess the the message is for that is that there's there's new stuff happening all the time. Like I just saw, you know, portable electric in there in the chat, which are the batteries. Warren, you've worked with batteries that can replace a generator. You know, we'll be having hydrogen batteries in the next two years. So they're already happening in England. They're using them on Bridgerton, and the and you get clean water coming out of it. That's literally the crew's drinking. So, you know. The technology is happening so quickly. And, and I say this at all my meetings, this is, this is like going from film to digital. This is happening. It's gonna take three or four years. The more prepared you are to answer and to think and to Im imagine and invent new ways of, of becoming even more sustainable, the better. You know, these, a lot of the frustrations that you guys are voicing on one or one production or the production teams that you normally work with, maybe they just need to hear or see some of these resources and go, you know, you guys are going to be left behind. You know, um, I had a. It, it will be a competitive advantage, basically, right? Because all the studios and networks will be demanding this. Yeah, definitely. Um, on that point, I wanted to. Um, before we Sorry, I didn't. Go, I didn't mean to cut you off, yeah. Claire. I just wanted. No, no, no. To that's, exactly, that's exactly. That's yeah. exactly right. I, I, mean, I wanted to. Exactly. Yeah, I wanted to build on that, Clara. Uh, some, one thing that might not be clear to a lot of the people listening 
is that there is like sustainability leads at each of the studios, right? So yeah. there is, can you talk a little bit about that? Like there, the, there's, yeah. it, you don't have to, it doesn't necessarily have to come from the bottom up. No, there's, um, so if, if I'm going to put this in the chat, it's called the greenproductionguide.com and the green production guide is, um, strangely it's, it's a group and the group is made of the sustainable production Alliance and the producers guild of America. And 10 years ago or 12 years ago, they got together and they decided they were going to work together to form this website. So the sustainable production Alliance, like is everybody. So it's Amazon, Amblin, Walt Disney, Fox, Hasbro, Universal, uh, Netflix, Paramount, Participant, Sony, Warner. Um, so they all have sustainability directors. So you can ask who that sustainability director is. The smaller companies have them as well. Um, the CBC has uh, sustainab is now using carbon calculators to calculate their impact. So CBC has sustainability directors. Um, a lot of the smaller organizations or the smaller independent film companies also really value this. So it's kind of like the, again, not to compare it to something, but it's like the early, you know, code writers and the, the developing computers, like it is the job of the future is sustainability. So everybody has that. There's um, the UK has, as I mentioned before, oh, and by the way, if you go on to Green Production Guide, you know, you could look at G, you know, GPG in action. And what's really cool about that is that if you scroll to the bottom, most of the, a lot of the videos are made in Canada of Canadian crews being sustainable. Um, there's also best practices. There's things you can download. There's, um, what is it called? Uh, the content pledge, which uh, is a group of uh, in COP26, November 2021, 12 of the UK's largest media organizations, including the BBC, uh, signed the co Climate Content Pledge. You can, you know, about how to be more on-screen sustainable. There's, it's, it's happening everywhere. And I think that we just get so busy and so kind of set in our ways that we're not ready to make the switch until somebody says, hey, it's time to, it's time to do this a little differently. And like, you know, hopefully with these amazing two committees that the DGC has started, we're trying to enlighten our members about how to become more positive citizens, how to become better, right? Better at your jobs, better at the new world, better in everything. And so we're, we're trying to get you guys the resources to do that. So it would be super helpful to find out how we can help and what, what else we can do because we're here as a committee and a lot of our committee members are on this call trying to do this for you so that you, you know, but the resources are huge. Definitely, well said. I'm gonna to go to Taylor, get a comment or question for you, Taylor. Yeah, thanks. I have a question and a comment. I just wondered if there was more information about the um, hydrogen, like the Bridgerton uh, system, if there's a place to check that out yet. Uh, yeah, I can, I'm, I will put that in the chat. Yeah, so amazing. Um, and then my comment is uh, one I was, I'm pretty inspired. I didn't really realize that this was, I missed the memo, it was for like directors. Um, so I'm a former AD assistant director turned art director, but uh, I still think I like, I wanna speak to the comment that was made by someone saying like that, like I one part that I really liked about this was the idea that there's influence, that that directors have influence. And I just wanted to like invite people to understand that no matter what part of film you are at, you also have influence. Like we are in a highly privileged like industry. Um, and also I want, I'm, I'm very seriously going to mention how we are people who can actually even maybe have a criminal charge and um, it won't affect us. So like I'm a climate justice activist for about 10 years um, and I work in film and this idea that it's all coming together is like so exciting. So <laughs> I just wanted to encourage the folks who have that privilege. And of course, we're all, we all arrive uh, to that privilege differently here in this group. It's quite a diverse group. 
But I'd like to just offer that in t- Toronto, I locked my neck to a bank. I got arrested for Standing Rock a long time ago. I had no, I went through the justice system. I had a lawyer who offered themselves pro bono here in Toronto. And I know there's a lot of climate justice uh, movement stuff in, in Vancouver as well. But we're people who could actually get arrested, have our charges dropped and fly through the states. So I have done it. Mm-hmm. I used to run a workshop around this very thing. And if people are interested in taking these kinds of ideas out into the public, not just through our stories, but in our stories that we would get into the news, that's something that this particular group of people actually have a real chance to do so because we are in the film industry. We're like, cool. You can have a charge on your record. It it doesn't (laughs) matter. But there are teachers out there. They can't, right? There are people that want to deal with children. They cannot. So We're just, you know, we're a particular industry. I wanted to say in all seriousness, (laughs) I know it sounds pretty funny. I'm going to link a little video of an action I did with two Anglican priests. And I'm talking about putting out like, not just a story in a movie, but a real story into the public that you could be a part of. If you've never been arrested, you've got a really good chance of getting off and I'd be happy to help you. Sounds like we should make the Taylor Flute story. Uh, I, I, de- I know Taylor, and we should definitely make the Taylor <laughs> story. <laughs> uh, let's let's sell she's, it. She's absolutely right. The media has the, that's the part we can't, we can't change the impact on. And I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember that, you know, when Jennifer Beale put her sweatshirt off her shoulder, it started a revolution. You know, we can now, sweats became cool. You can do this on screen. You can do this with your voice. Nobody would have bought a Prius if Cameron Diaz didn't have one. Like, you know, these are the actions. This is the power we have and and use your voice. Yeah. So on that note, I just want to show our last slide and then just go to last questions as we try and wrap up here. Um, last slide is sort of basically around what uh, Claire was just saying, which was using your voice um, at, events and stuff as a director. Um, maybe Julian's disappeared, but I can basically uh, share it myself. Um, but uh, let me just click on here. Um, where is it? Oh, there we go. Um, basically the idea that um, when you're out in public, when you're doing publicity for your films, for your projects, when you have a stage and everyone's looking at you, those are opportunities also to just normalize the conversation and bringing attention and, you know, letting people know about the choices you made in the, in the creation of the project and showing that it's possible and reminding people that there is an emergency happening (laughs) and that it, and that there is hope. And these are the ways of having hope. And, you know, and if I want to talk to you more, you know, after the, the screening or the panel or whatever, to come talk to you and, um, just sort of a reminder that often as filmmakers, we are in positions where um, we are speaking to large groups of people. And those are opportunities to just continue um, the progress on the movement and to have people know about the resources and, and have longer individual conversations. Um, so that's something to, to remember whenever you find yourself suddenly with a bunch of people looking at you. Um, the fastest so we'll way to that. get yeah. this, the fastest way to get this conversation and make something happen is to get it out of the environmentalist conversation and get it out of the climate change conversation. Like if you're being interviewed, if you're, you know, if you've like, just own it, this is part of your identity, you know, just even if, yeah, I make, I make kick ass sustainable productions. I make amazing stories. I'm a filmmaker and I'm responsible. You know, those, those, that's huge. Again, use your voice. Um, any last questions or thoughts before we close up here? Uh, we've got a lot of amazing people in the room who've been very shy. Um, Grayson, take it away. I just have a question because somebody mentioned that I think it was Germany that you you can't have any plastic bags if your production to be seen. Is there a site that like talks about different countries' rules? Because that's kind of important. I don't I don't think there is. I think we could probably get it from Albert. And it wasn't plastic bags. It was actually they described it's a cop show and they were doing a stakeout 
and they weren't allowed to have coffee cups. <laughs> they had to have a paper, thermos. Paper, yeah, thermos. Hudson and Rex, awesome show. Directed on it. My episodes are coming up soon. So Warren, Best were you told that detective. you weren't allowed to do that, or was that something the props like? When it they wasn't specific to my episode. I don't think this particular thing, but um, the props was really on. Like we just, it, it it was one of those sets that. I didn't even have to think about it because it was already thought of in terms of uh, recyclable um, or, or, you know, uh, things you can wash, like no single use entities. Um, it's a great show. Yeah. Watch it. It's um, awesome. <laughs> finding, finding out those international distribution. Yeah. It would be interesting be, to, would be, to get one database, right? Cause is, it would be helpful because saying. then that's a tool the director could use like, Hey, I heard you were thinking of selling this in Germany. Are you aware of this? Uh, <laughs> this little thing here, uh, we might want to do this to protect ourselves. That might be another way of, uh, you know, convincing people of dollars and cents. Uh, Marianne. Um, yeah, just to Grayson's uh, inquiry, and I think probably it's been mentioned tonight, but there's no shortage of information <laughs> about what is being done. You just have to Google it. It's like, I remember like in, as a part of our work with the uh, DGC NS, NS CAC committee, I was Googling around and like Italy, for example, has a very, very detailed articulate green plan for their filmmaking. You could probably Google every country in Europe, um, most countries in Europe anyway, and say, what's your green film plan? And just, just learn. So it's part, a lot of it's very much about sharing information and, and, and I think, yeah, uh, regarding our DGC Green website, you know, we do have a resource uh, page or, or link in there, but we're, we're working on trying to like, just make that really up to date as well. So, but really you'd be encouraged. It's going to get better. I, yeah, I and, swear and really it's going to get better. And, and impressed by just doing a little bit of like deep diving into, into what is existing elsewhere in the world already. And I have to say, we're, I mean, BC's doing pretty well, but it is pretty slow still in, in Ontario, given the size of the industry. But there's hope. There's hope on the horizon, I think. But uh, right. it's the first place I went. So <laughs> where? Yeah. To your website, to the website. I went there oh, first. Okay. And then I was like, oh, is there more? But again, just again, there will I, be. I just there remember will be more. There will be more. There will be more on our website for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah, trying to find the balance between all the things that you like. Because environment, like the environment, isn't the only thing that I'm also pushing for. I sit on the BIPOC committee and DGCBC's um, DEI committee, plus uh, the guild, uh, the locations guild one too. So, like, it's just you know, it's trying to balance out your time and making sure that you're putting your energy to everything. So sometimes for me, it's just easier having like people being like, go to the site, you'll find everything. <laughs> yeah, and, we're, we're, um, we're working on that. We're working on trying to curate and bring everything into the DGC site. So even though we're not posting it, we'll post the link to the site that you can go check out next. So you yeah. can go deeper on it. And I think there are some in our resource page. The other thing we should mention is that since we formed this committee two years ago, two and a half years ago, um, there are now district sustainability committee. So in every district at, in the guild, there are people doing this regionally as well. So we're the national committee, but it's happening. It's the, the conversation has changed in the last 36 months, um, 24 months dramatically. So that's what I mean. Like it's, it's happening and it's happening fast and we will try and keep you guys informed. And, and it's really the district council committees that will be right there with the members doing doing a lot of the heavy lifting because it's it's so local like what we're talking about it's literally on our sets and in our offices uh in our rooms so um we amazing we, we, su we support what they're doing for sure well i just want to thank everybody so much for participating and your questions and your thoughts and and feel free to uh share these insights with everyone on your sets and crews i want to give a huge thank you to clara for your wisdom and your uh, and your energy on this topic. We're all just in your shadow trying to catch up, which is amazing. Um, <laughs> well, I'm not uh, working on set, so it's not fair. Yeah. But, yes. <laughs> thank uh, you for having me. Yes, and Warren, thank you for coming here and, and showing the leadership for the Guild. Um, if anybody um, wants to find out more or get in contact with us, I'm sure any of us would be happy to talk with you in more detail. Um, you can reach out 
uh, through Julian or through us if you if you want um, if you want our information. Julian can always connect us um, for any of our other amazing DGC events. Julian's also an incredible uh, resource. Uh, so is Hans. Uh, we have all sorts of events running almost every month, um, both in person and and on Zoom. Um, and so stay stay tuned through your email for all the other cool stuff we're doing or follow us on social. Um, thank you so much, everybody, and have a great evening.